All right. I'm so excited to be here today with Timothy Joe, a fine artist, birder, and a great all-around guy. Thanks for being on the show again. Man, thanks for having me back, Marley. And so your class this year is going to be about hummingbirds. Why, why hummingbirds? You know, I was just fascinated with hummingbirds. Even as a little kid, my mother would have these, she raised flowers like crazy, and they would come up to the window, and she'll always yell to us, like, hey, there's a hummingbird. And I'm like, you know, tearing down the hallway, trying to see it. And you now to this day, I have my own hummingbird feeders, and I have like four hummingbirds that come by and visit me. And it's just, they're just a cool little creature anyway. They're so small, but they're so powerful in a way. So when I was invited to be a part of the, you know, Wild Wonder Nature German Conference, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. And they kind of gave me like, well, what would you like to do for us? I thought I was going to get assigned an animal of some sort, but they just said, what, whatever you want to do, we're just glad to have you. You're, we know you're talented. We know you love nature. We would love to have you on. So I was like, let me do the hummingbird. It's like, I, I want to do the hummingbird. So that's how it came about. So I'm super excited. It's going to take place and very soon. I know, right? It's next week. I was just looking at my my schedule and doing some of my like food shopping because I'm basically going to try to take as many of the classes as possible. And I'm just going to be on the computer like all day long. We'll, we'll get into preparations and stuff here in a little bit. Um, maybe you could say, uh, you know, like, do you have any, um, do you have any pages uh, nearby to show sort of like your style or the style that you're going to be teaching or any, any, yes, humble drawing or any, any visual eye candy for our visual audience here? Oh, of course I do. Um, now this journal is the one I use for my places that I visit and locations, but every once in a while I'll mess around and paint a bird in there. Mm -hmm. So here All is right, I'm put you on the uh, solo layout so people can see that better. <laughs> this is a downy woodpecker that I've seen today actually at oh, my wow. theater. And um it's just I just love woodpeckers and these birds that do their own thing. Um my style of art um is very a loose approach. Um mm -hmm. I am more like a representational artist. I don't try to go for every detail, every feather or whatnot, but um it's just a loose freestyle. Uh, and I paint very quickly. That's a lot of things that I get compliments mm -hmm. on. I was like, gosh, do you really paint that fast? Mm -hmm. And it's just because of my training. You know, I'm self-taught, but I learned a lot in these past six, seven years that it speeds up my process. I, mm -hmm. I do like a roadmap in my mind of what I want to capture, how much detail I want to capture, the composition. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's almost muscle memory, dipping mm -hmm. into the paints, getting the color mixtures right and putting it down i pay a lot of attention to values i start mm -hmm. with my dark colors first uh and then i move gradually up to the very highlights and when i get to the mm -hmm. highlights especially for you know right here yeah you know that's like the last mark i'll ever make right right when I make that mark is is finished yeah and you work with gouache right yes i love using gouache I'll use watercolors too, but gouache is such a, a forgiving medium mm -hmm. that you know it almost acts like acrylics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, it dries very fast and it's easy to work with. If you make a mistake, you can paint right over it. Yeah, you like, and you're you're fine. Mm -hmm. So I definitely love using gouache and watercolor. They're they're kind of like always in my backpack when I'm going nature drawing. Mm -hmm. Can you show us some more pages in there? Sure can. Now let's see. Like I said, this is my location journal, so I'll have things like yeah, that. Yeah, let's show that to you. People will be interested in that. Yeah, so these are like places I've been going down the country roads, and I've been seeing this abandoned store from, from my whole youth. And one day mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I'm going to paint this, uh, along with preserving um, nature with my art. I, was, I also like to preserve places. So things that are forgotten alongside the road there that meant something to someone years and years ago. I think they're worth being in my journal too. So I kind of chase birds, yeah, uh, animals, funguses, all this kind of thing, and I just capture them all. Um, here's another one. Sometimes it could be just pure nature. Oh, dang! You know, it don't, it don't have to be a yeah an animal, but just the sunlight. And the, yeah, yeah, I think I would recognize that. I hadn't seen that one of yours before, but I think I would recognize no, that as yours. No, um, no right yeah. this one. This one came on a. Almost a by request, and that's what the little topic says by request, because um, we had a wildlife photographer come by the Joe Farm. Mm -hmm. and we was taking pictures of egrets and stuff when they flew in like early, early in the morning. So we pretty much were out there all day taking pictures of birds, 
And at the very end of the day, the photographer says, you know, Tim, I definitely want to see you do a painting in your journal. I would like to get that in, um, you know, on film. So I said, OK. So I set my easel up and I said, well, the sun's setting. Let's grab the sunlight before it disappears. And I started to paint this scene of the pasture next to the Joe farm. And it's very scary to do these later the day paints because the sunlight yeah. is flying. flying. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I started this when the sun was like maybe up here. So as the sun right. is lower, you need to put those final touches right where the sweet spot is. And so that is not easy. I'm scared too of doing a sunset or like, like uh, yeah, trying to capture the actual sun in the painting is not easy. So it's not. Wow. It's, it's almost like you had to think ahead of the sun. Like yeah. you have to think maybe like maybe 15 minutes before you the sun actually gets to where you need it to be. And so that's that's one. Wow, that's awesome. And um, let's see. Of course, I love. I said, here this red-breasted nuthatch hitting, sitting here. And I think I did this as a demonstration too. Um, um yeah, that's for an art toolkit. My friends over there. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they are super awesome, and I did this demo for them. And it's just this nuthatch, and I made it to where the the bright sunlight is up against him. I love my style is very much prone to doing like light and shadows and contrast mm -hmm. between those and just lighting up a subject is one of my favorite things to do. Wow. So, yeah. And this is at the Wheel of Wildlife Refuge up here in Decatur, Alabama during the Festival of Cranes. So that's, uh, I did that actually on the scene there did like an under 30 minutes and people were kind of blown away by how fast I can get things done and paint it. So that's what happened. But there's that scene. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me. Mario it kind of cut out on me. You still there? Can you hear me? Sorry about that. No, it's all good. I was uh, going to keep rambling on about art. So it's, <laughs> it's okay. All right. Well, I'm noticing lots of comments over here. So I'm going to say hi to some of the people in the comments. I see oh. Angie is here. Sandra is here. Jean, Tamara, um, and Cindy, um, DJ, all here um, watching this. And a lot of people are commenting about oh, wow. the texture of uh, Drew Rosales just got here. Could you talk a little bit about your paper that you use in your journal and, and your technique? And if that is the the um, sort of method that you're going to be teaching at the Wild Wonder Conference. Okay, I'm glad you asked about that. This paper is, I love it, but the sad news about it, the manufacturer of this book uh, no longer make these. Oh it's no! Very, very thick. It's handmade paper, and I will learn how to to make this paper one day. Uh -huh. So you can see it there. It's very stiff because I don't really like painting on very thin paper because mm -hmm. it'll just roll up on you. I know there is warping involved, but this one, I mean, it stays right where you left it. So yeah. I, I, I love it very much. But since the sad news is they don't make these anymore. And look, you can even see the texture from where I'm holding it. Yeah. Yeah. All those deep ridges. They really lend to my style because I love really? using texture to tell part of the story. You can see it there. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really deep. And I use my underpainting method, that reddish brown. That is, again. that is watercolor right there. Oh, um, right. It has that glow to it, the glow that comes through. Mm -hmm. And that's how it starts. So this is like two shotgun houses in Selma, Alabama that I was going to paint. Yeah. End off this whole journal series of this book. Uh huh. And so that's how I start. And I'll paint, uh, paint it over gouache. Here, I can show you a sneak peek of one I'm working on now. Ooh, sneak peek. Yeah. I'm not finished with this one yet. Wow, those purple, yeah. those purple colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was done like in the middle of the night. My sister-in-law took this picture at night in Selma. And, you know, it had the porch light on and everything. So I was going to make sure those colors pop. Yeah. So I chose to put a lot of purple in the background. So... Yeah, yeah, I think paper, I, I think that characteristic of that, that paper that you use and the, under, the underpainting... Um, with the gouache and then, uh, I mean the underpainting with the watercolor and the gouache over it with that glow. Like mm -hmm. if I saw, if I saw that and it didn't have your name on it, I would know uh, <laughs> that was you. Yeah, this is what I was oh, like, yeah. Is that that dome in Florence? That's exactly right. I was on the rooftop of my bed and breakfast and there it was 
Oh and my it, goodness. It was late in the day and this is the evening sun on it. And I was like, I have 25 minutes to get this thing done. And I was painting as though people were chasing me. Wow, and that is it was so satisfying. I, I had to move so fast. I didn't have time to even, you know, write here about, uh -huh. about the experience. But I remember as clear as day. So I can rewrite this anytime I choose to. But I just want my students to know, like, you can make beautiful art. You don't have to kill yourself over it. You don't have to labor so hard. Uh -huh. I mean, people are like, how long did you take you to do this? I'm like, oh, an hour. Oh, less than, you know, 45 minutes. And they're like, how? I use a, you gonna see it during the um, the conference. I'll start with a, the biggest brush I can find, uh -huh. get the color down, block in my shapes and refine it as I go. And I just know when I reach that, reach that level of doneness that I want, yeah. stop painting. Yeah. I know when to stop painting. And, you know, wow. and it's okay if you leave the, the underpainting peeking through and stuff like that, because um, people just get a kick out of it. And I just love sharing it. You know, that's, it's been a long time so to get cool. to this point where I can paint and get it done so fast. Now, I actually create my own journals now, because since this got discontinued, I found a book binder. She taught me how to make my own <laughs> journals. Um, I use Arches watercolor paper. It's the roughest one they got. It's not as rough as this one. They do have some rougher, but it'll cost so much money to make it. It's like, I don't mm -hmm. think I can sell these because the price will just skyrocket. Yeah. I, I might just go for it anyway. Who knows? But I actually started making my own journals. I have three that's made right now. And I have like maybe 28 zigzag journals uh, that's already been created. And I, I will put that on my website for a sale. I just hadn't had time to do it. So if people wanted one for me, they'll see me on Instagram. They'll send me a direct message saying, hey, I will love one. So the mini zigzag journals are $25. The full size journals are $50. And All right, I'm gonna put your. I'm gonna put your. It sounds like you're really busy making them already, but I'm gonna go ahead and put your uh, your Instagram right here for anybody who doesn't already know about, it, and you're probably gonna get a bunch more <laughs> orders too. Hey, so, oh, do me a favor, make me so busy where I can't sleep. I'll just be making journals in my sleep or something. I, I would <laughs> love that. And you know, what's another good thing that's happening that the hospital here, the Huntsville Hospital Foundation here in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, won a grant with me. So. We are going to teach the nursing staff for four weeks on nature journaling because they have been super stressed out with the COVID oh. thing. All this stuff is happening. We're going to release some stress. We're going to go out to the park or whatever, and we're going to paint anything, <laughs> anything nature, anything moving, whether it be butterflies, flowers, seeds, fungus, trees, um, because they, they need it. And That I'll, is such and, a great idea. Yeah, and we I'll be giving a talk. I will have five or six of my paintings there on display, nature related. And I'll just give my talk on why I do the stuff I'm doing and how I do it. So I'm super excited. It's going to be spring of next year, which can't get here fast enough. Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff now that's keeping me busy. Yeah. Alone. Well, I can't wait to hear how that goes. Hopefully that, that seems like the kind of thing that could get spread. I mean, I feel like everybody working at hospitals and stuff could use something I like that. It. Yeah, I mean, I I have family members who are in the nursing field and the horror stories that they have, um, you know, people who get bad news health wise, people are passing yeah. away and, you know, family members just broken up. And it's like me and my little art, I use it to try to do as much healing as I possibly can. I mean, mm -hmm. it does so much for me. And it's like, you know what, if I can paint a beautiful sunset and somebody's just going through something, it just made them like, oh. That's beautiful. You know, that that helped me. So yep. I did my part, you know, it's like it's small, but it means something. So yeah. that's that's why I'm trying to do all this, because, you know, as many people who want to listen to what I got to say, I'll keep telling my story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Wow. That is that is so cool. All right. Let's um go a, t a little bit more into some uh, stuff about hummingbirds and then some wild wonder other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, like for your class, for people who are considering taking your class, like I'm already signed up and everything, but what is the most important thing that students will take away from your class? Um, they'll get the confidence to go out there and try it for themselves. Um, it's cool to watch, you know, me paint, nothing wrong with that. But I've seen so much, even through my classes, when this pandemic hit, people say, I used to love doing art. I used to love sketching. I used to love drawing. And I stopped. Yeah, and I'll ask them, well, what what happened? Like, why'd you stop? And they'll say, life getting away, you know, got to raise mm -hmm. a family, got to go work, and those are all true things. They, that does happen. And here I am coming up was like, you know what? Why not just 
get a mini zigzag journal or something small and just do a quick painting. It takes less than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, use a big brush. Just just get the essence of what you're looking yeah. for. It doesn't have to be a super detailed Mona Lisa style art that takes five, six, seven months to complete. They're like, no. I mean, and I'll actually cut out like small trading card size, two and a half by three and a half inches. And I've been known to sell those those miniature paintings. Yeah. And it's so great because like it gives me a lot of brush mileage. You know, yeah. I learned very quickly how a scene could work small. And if it looks good, blow it up bigger later. But you can knock out a, one of those paintings in 30 minutes and on your lunch break. Yeah. And get your art fixed and you feel all cool. Like I created something special and something beautiful. You can either sell them or just trade it to another art friend. Yeah. So I'll put them no excuses, with, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's just you can come to my class and I'm real easy going. I want you to not run into the same pitfalls I did <laughs> trying to get better. You know, if, if I could direct you on what to buy, what not to buy, or, you know, knowing when your paintings finish, uh, finding your art style, your hummingbird will not look like mine. And mm -hmm. that's okay. <laughs> it's not supposed to, it's supposed to look like you painted it. Mm -hmm. But what I do is like, I, I'm kind of a co coach more than a teacher. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, force my style on anyone you know if you like a certain color that you know mixes this way i'll show you how to get there i may not use it but if you mm -hmm. want it you know, okay well let's use this turquoise green color or let's mm -hmm. use this magenta instead of lizard and crimson it, it'll work mm -hmm. out yeah and so what kind of materials because like looking at your stuff it seems like the materials are really important are you going to be for the for the class you're teaching what materials are you asking that people bring yeah, when the class starts, I will do something similar to my old mentor, Bob Ross, if you want to call him that, where he'll mm -hmm. have like the colors come across the screen. But what I will do is I will actually will hold it up to the screen and say, okay, here's my paint mm -hmm. of, you know, titanium white gouache. Mm -hmm. um, you need azo yellow, a bright yellow. You know, my palette is like warm and cool, the split primary. There'll mm -hmm. be a warm and cool yellow, a warm and cool red, a blue, mm -hmm. a couple of earth tones. And that's that's all you'll need. So mm -hmm. I will say you got your white, you got your, you know, your cool yellow, like your cadmium yellow light or your azo yellow. And then you have like a warmer yellow, like gamboge or mm -hmm. hanzo yellow deep. So I will start calling them out because I don't want the students to get so caught up. Like, I don't have that name right. that you just said, but like, no, but you have the same color temperature or it's mm -hmm. in the same family than what I'm using. Right. Use it's okay. Um, there's like hundreds and hundreds of colors you can get stuck on. Mm -hmm. But if you have colors from these families or these temperatures, you, you'll be okay. Yeah. So will I be like, for example, uh, if I show up to your class and I don't have gouache, will I be able to kind of just get along with regular watercolors? You, you can, because the only difference between gouache and watercolor, gouache is actually watercolor. It's just opaque. Mm -hmm. Because with gouache paint, I can add enough water to it that it will behave as watercolor. Mm -hmm. And it dries to a very matte finish, like right. watercolor. So they're in the same family. Mm -hmm. it, the only difference of watercolor and gouache is your application of it. You mm -hmm. know, with watercolor, you put the lightest color out first. Mm -hmm. And you get darker as the paint goes on. Gouache is the opposite. You start off dark and you go to your lights. So we can still meet <laughs> in the middle <laughs> where I say... Yeah. Oh, mix of a dark color for this dark green that this hummingbird is, because I chose a ruby throat hummingbird. Nice. Well. So, and you know they had that beautiful green colors. It wouldn't be a dark green; it'd be a bright, saturated looking green. How do you mix those? So, for you with your watercolors, you'll mix that bright, saturated green first and put it down on the page. When I will be doing it at the end. So, it's all about keeping those values where they need to be. Yeah. You just keep getting darker and darker to your where you want to be. Gouache seems, will start dark and move up to light. It seems like Cindy here had a similar question. Uh, she signed up for your class and she hasn't used gouache before. Um, she's wondering, is, is it worth it if she can go out to the store and get some gouache? She'll probably get more out of your class if she does that, right? Okay, yes, but I will have to give you a word of caution. You know, a lot of the typical art stores, I don't know if I get trouble if I name drop stores, but um, we know what they are. Uh, they will have gouache, but it's not like the kind for artist quality. It's like very low level. I can't say work. I don't want to get us beaten up by the manufacturers, but 
<laughs> is they will have the colors, but the problem is that there's they have so much filler in them, they don't have a high pigment content, and mm. you'll get frustrated and angry because, like, why are my colors not richer in Nick's as richly as Tim is? Mm-hmm. Tim is using a brand of wa- uh, gouache that are meant for professional grade work. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean they're super expensive, but they are different. Um, mm-hmm. The brand I have is uh, from M. Graham. Mm. Uh, they got other brands out there too. They got Windsor and Newton. They got a uh, Holbein. They got all these other uh, awesome manufacturers that are top shelf. Um, I start off with gouache with the five set that I, um, M. Graham has like a five set piece where it just have like your white, red, yellow, blue, black. That's a nice starting point, but you can add mm. on to that. Um, the The average price of some of my colors are like around $12, $13, $14. If you mm-hmm. go for the blues, the cobalts, stuff like that, they're a little more expensive. They're like around $15, $16. Mm-hmm. But you don't need a ton of colors. Get your two yellows, your two reds, your two blues. I always go with um, uh, yellow ochre. Mm-hmm. You'll never catch me on the field without yellow ochre. I don't care who you are. You, you will never catch me without it. If it's one of those things, like if you have to get rid of a color, I'll get rid of red before I get rid of that one. Uh-huh. So yellow ochre is there burnt sienna like an earth tone brown color will be good and there's a green i'll use called viridian yeah i will never use viridian straight out of the tube to make like a tree foliage or oh something. no that is just to calm the red down if you mix in a nice beautiful dark, dark color throw viridian green and a, a lizard crimson together it makes a gorgeous um purple color yeah, I, that's something that I, that's definitely noticeable about your work is it's not that uh, – I mean, those greens are really da- – that's why I'm – when it comes to teaching uh, uh, beginners, uh, I'm always so afraid of the um, – or not afraid, but hesitant to, to bring in the color early on because you see them – it's like it's a tree, it's a plant. They just grab the green crayon or the green marker or the green paint yes. and they just put it all over the, over the tree without really paying attention to like – what color exactly is that tree? And and it's crazy because it is scary, especially when you're doing plain air. You're out there in front of a tree, and you're like, I see that it's all these greens, but if you really have to learn how to look, it took me a while to learn that. Learn how to see again. You taught in school, oh, the grass is green. So that's a big leafy mm-hmm. green color. Oh, that's an apple. You get the fire edge of red, and you yeah. throw it on the apple. And you start looking as, as you get older, and as you get more mature, you're like, that green is not really as green as that mm-hmm. crayon is. It's, I see all. some little ochres in there. I see some purples in there. If you really look at the shade of a tree, you will see purple mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when I started to learn that and really see it, you have to mix up greens to where they don't get boring because you can't mm-hmm. use the same, light, the same green color in the yeah. background like you use in the foreground, like you mm-hmm. use on the grass itself. You've got to change it. You've got to think about atmospheric perspective. As stuff gets mm-hmm. further away from me, it's going to get cooler. Put more blue in that mixture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as it gets closer, bring your yellows into the mixture. Your your warm yellows, your gambos, your Hanzo yellow mediums, cadmium yellow medium. Those will be mixed with your blues to make your grasses look much warmer mm-hmm. and greener than the ones that be in the very background. So I will get so many questions about that when I'm doing my demonstrations and teaching my works. And I always make sure that I point my camera to my palette from time to time mm-hmm. and i show you like look i'm picking up this yellow not that yellow why yeah do do that because of this you know and there's like oh my gosh that's why my you know greens look so flat because i didn't think and that's all it is because i ran off that cliff and it made that yeah mistake. so yeah let's, go, let's talk a little bit about some technical stuff i um you probably know another um uh, dang, I'm blanking on her name right now. Liz Clayton Fuller. She does gouache, a lot of gouache mm. painting of birds. And I think she's in North Carolina. Um, I interviewed her and oh, she taught last year at Wild Wonder also. And uh, I got really excited. I bought it because last year I did the thing where I just bought all the supplies people were going to be uh, talking about in their classes. Mm-hmm. And I bought hers, but I didn't um, learn I, I interviewed her later and learned about the palette that she uses for her gouache she uses like two palettes she has an airtight palette for her gouache and then she mixes it, uh, right when she's painting she mixes it in like a, a ceramic dish okay. but um, all of mine got all dried up i put it I, I i bought all these gouache i put them all into this regular sort of palette that i had for my water cup like for my watercolors they all started cracking and falling out and so 
Um, I, I, there's a couple people here asking about dried up gouache. How do you manage your gouache? Do you, um, you know, what does your palate look like? Um, and can people, once it dries up, is there something you can do about it? Oh gosh, that's a really great question. Um, for my style of art, um, my gouache is poured out on my palate like it's oil paints. I don't really care to have them to wear they in a case or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I have my watercolor sets that can be in a travel case, but their their makeup is different because some mm -hmm. of the binders are honey, and it and they mm -hmm. you know it doesn't crack as easily. Um, so for my gouache, they stay in the tubes with me as though they're I'm carrying oh, wow. oil paint or acrylics. Okay. Um, when I set my palette out, I'll take a shop towel like those paper blue paper towels you see at the yeah. mechanic store or not. Um, Walmart cares. I'm, uh, you can get them other places. I cut them into thin strips, maybe like two inches by eight inches, something like that. And I was pouring my um, paint onto them, but I have my spray bottle and I lightly mist the entire thing. And it'll keep them moist and pliable to where I'll mix them because I use my gouache like I use oil paints. Mm -hmm. the oil paints will sit there and be wet for days. Right. That's how I treat my um, my gouache. Oh, so you bring that home on that on that uh, paper towel, and then you can use that again afterwards. You could, but uh, you had to make sure to check in on it and dampen it back up. But I've just learned how to put enough on there to get the painting done. Okay, and got it. There is like you just throw it away. It's like okay, right, that's what I thought. That's what I thought you were saying. So you 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 squeeze it out in the field, and you just squeeze out as much as you're going to use that yes. at that moment. All right. Hopefully everybody heard that. Um, that's, that's great. And um, I, I think explaining it with the sort of oil painting kind of example uh, makes in my mind is making sense. And it makes me want to experiment more with gouache again and maybe even buy some. I think I can get a little bit of gouache. where I'm in Quito, the capital city of Ecuador right now. There is an art store, so I might be able to get some before your class. Um, so speaking of this, like what is your history with the Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, like, have you been before? Have you taught before? Um, how did you hear about it? No, oh, okay, that's a great question because um, this is my very first time. I have not attended last year. Um, they actually found me. Um, it was one of those things where me journaling and doing art stuff is basically for me, but I had no idea, like, there is a planet full of people who love doing this just as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And they're like, they come together to do this sort of thing. Cause you know, growing up in a small town, I was always the learner. If I want to paint something, I got to do it myself. If I got to go hunt something down, learn its history and, and paint it, I have to do it. But to see that there's a, a whole community of people who come together and say, Hey, we love nature. We love painting. Like we're bringing it together and it's for the whole world to see. I was like, wow, that's awesome. But I know I was, um, I was reached out by one of the representatives there because they've been following what I've been doing on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. My grandparents' farm, the, the Connecting the Birds and Nature Tours. I'm out there with my easel. I'm out there with my palette. And I'm painting stuff on my, you know, on my family's property mm -hmm. that's been around in my family for years. And it just goes to show you when you just do something that you're passionate about and you just put your all into it, people are watching you. People will notice like, wow, that guy really is good at catching this stuff. And, and he's so cool about it. And, you know, and I love sharing uh my experience and so it was really just one of those blessings and you know that came out of the blue sky really and when they asked me we would like you to be a faculty member and teach a class i mean it wasn't even a question like will i do it it's just when is it yeah. <laughs> so, so i just need to know where i need to do and and they've been super helpful the the staff the, the curators the people who's going to be online with me directing the questions tell me how much time i got left you know, we, we're really going to have a good time. And I cannot believe that it's over 700 people that signed up for this thing. Mm -hmm. I, I was excited when it was like over 100 because I never dealt with more than, you know, 90 people anyway. But for it to be like 700 folks are going to be yeah. tuning in to watch me paint a hummingbird. It's, you know, of course it's cool, but it's kind of scary. But at the same time, I won't see any of you. So yeah. I'll just be working away. I'll just have a lot of spectators. That's all. I find that part more scary than standing up in front of a room with that many people because it's like you're looking at the screen and, and, and you know, they're like, OK, go. And then like I, the first time I did it online for Wild Wonder, I was like sitting there. I didn't know I was I didn't know I was live yet. And I was just sitting there and someone was like, 
Marley, start talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you're all in. Say something. <laughs> so um, what are you taking other classes? And if so, what classes are you most excited about? Um, as far as the, the Wild Wonder Conference? Yeah. Um, I haven't signed on to take any class. I guess I was just so focused, make sure I do a good job with this one. Yeah. But I am going to be like looking in on everything. Um, for me to take it all in that this is happening, it was like, it's really mind blowing. So I just want to be just a also a spectator. I want to learn from everybody. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of misconceptions. People look at me and they look at the, the style of art I create. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, wow, this is amazing. But I get just as much pleasure out of watching other artists create yeah. art. I love to see other people make things. And, and it's, it's not even a competition type of thing. It's just like, wow, look what they created. Mm -hmm. And even if I get to the point where I like what they did and I want to try myself, I'll always do it in my style. I'll always be respectful. You know, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not going to rip off any other artist style technique. But you, but I know what resonates with me, and they know what resonates with them. Yeah, and it's and it's almost one of those things like we keep each other encouraged because yeah. I may run into a rut, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, and maybe they'll shout it out on the chat. I'll just hit a wall. Like mm -hmm. I'll have all these cool things I want to paint, and guess what? Four or five days go on, and nothing happened art wise, mm -hmm. and it drives me up the wall. It was like I know I want to paint this butterfly. I know I want to paint a swallowtail kite. I know. And it, like I say, I'll hit a wall. Yeah. And, you know, and watching people on Instagram doing all these things with their art and nature, it's not only had to be just nature, just art, period. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll get me through that hump. And it's like, okay, yeah. let's, let's get back on the bike now since I fell off of it. Yeah. It can be, it can be encouraging to see other people and especially being a part of an event I, I found or, or working alongside other people or even like for me, after I interview someone like you, then I get all energized. Like if I'm in a in a, a, a rut or whatever, artistic rut, and then I interview someone and we have like a good conversation, I get all energized after that, then the rut is not so much of a problem. I don't want to go into this too deep because this could be like a whole conversation, but it's really funny that you, you, you mentioned style and sort of not copying anyone's style because I made this 30-day uh, uh, nature journaling challenge okay. that I've been uh, promoting. Mm -hmm. and, and today's... Uh, today's uh, prompt is actually about uh, stealing like an artist. And there's, you know, this is something like, I mean, people go in different directions with this, but there's like a whole book that maybe you've heard of called Steal Like an Artist. And it's all mm -hmm. about, it says all art is a remix and that, you know, <laughs> that every, basically everything is always, you know, we're always kind of like in our heads, we're inspired or influenced by different things we've seen. And uh, John Muir Laws also uses the term, uh, in sort of a positive way. And he, he, maybe I'll compare it to, cause you're an engineer, right? Yes. I'm a mechanical engineer. So my other, my other engineer friend, I think he's an electrical engineer too. He said he compared it to, to his company. So he's like, my company is it's proprietary, right? Like there's no sharing of idea. There's no sharing of like technology and ideas. But then he talked about how like in other, th in, in some software, for example, it's open source. And so he's like, nature journaling community is kind of like open source because, you know, we look at someone's page and we're like, oh, that that's cool. What what is something that they did on that page that maybe like the way they use black and white down here or gray for the writing? Maybe that's something like I can copy. So yes. like as John Muir Loss has tried to make the word steal sound like positive. But uh, but yeah, anyways, I think it's an interesting conversation. I don't think there's like necessarily a right or wrong. But it's really funny that you brought that up. And that's like today's uh, today's prompt was I told people, um, you know, the Wild Wonder Conference is coming up. Look up one of the artists or one of the other teachers. Look at some aspect of their style. So, like, for example, if I were to do for, were, were to copy you today, I would go I would look at your style and then I would try, you know, to sort of dissect it or analyze it like, wow, I really like there's like a feeling um, about you know, Tim's work that is really characteristic and then what try to understand, like analyze it and, and then figure out like, Oh, not like the, the, the thing that clicked for me, this uh, talking to you right now is the underpainting. I don't think that really clicked for me as well. Um, so much before. So now I'm like, okay, maybe if I tried just one painting sort of copying that concept, see how it works for me, maybe I can adapt aspects of it. So that was my prompt for, uh, for people today because i think a lot of people too when they're first starting out and you, you i think you teach about this a lot is when people are first starting out sometimes 
they don't know what their style is yet. And people no, they don't. Get in it, their it heads. Five years to figure out mine. And it's a rewarding journey, but it, you, it, it requires a lot of legwork. Um, when I was trying to really get better as an artist, it was 2014, December, where I was like, I felt like there was a bar that I could reach, but it was quite not, I couldn't grasp it. I may touch it with the tip of my fingers, but I couldn't do this to it. Mm -hmm. But um, I started reading books, you know, plein air magazines, these uh, fine artists who use all these, you know, these deep, rich, reddish uh, underpaintings, and then they'll paint a person on top of it. And it's like their flesh feels warm to the touch. Like if I were to touch the painting, I will feel like the, the warmth of the skin or something. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was like, whoa, I, I really like how when I put the green trees and on, on top of this earth tone color that I make, it's like the, they vibrate a little bit. It's not the same as just painting on a pure white surface. Nothing wrong with that. I've seen people who paint on a pure white canvas and it's just as real as anything I would have put up on my underpainting. Yeah. But it's a preference. Um, I, I have a great friend, artist friend, Jennifer McChristian, professional artist. And she does this magenta and golden underpainting. And I told her, I told her to her face, like, I can see your painting a mile away and know it was you. I don't even need to read your name or yeah. I just know it's you. And it's it, it takes time. And she always says, you got to get your brush mileage up, just like your car. Mm -hmm. Keep and when I said those small paintings, that was me getting my brush mileage up because mm -hmm. I didn't spend five days working on a large painting. Yeah. To figure out what like I did like 50 of these small ones. And say, oh, I like this, or oh, this green is lovely. What did I use to uh, mix that? Oh, I use this and this. So I'm learning like all these lessons yeah. in a short period of time. So when I came back to do my solo exhibit in Selma, who've been champion for me since 2017, 2018, they was like, oh my gosh, Tim, we was with you when you really was getting your mm -hmm. legs on you. Now you're just flying, and mm -hmm. I can see how quickly you jump in your skill level. And is it because those little, uh, those tiny little paintings, uh, making yeah. mistakes, getting better? Why that did not work this time? And you learn from there. Now, yeah, I love that. There was somebody who asked in a question about uh, going back to the gouache thing. If it dries out, can you use mm -hmm. it? Some gouache you can't. Acrylic gouache you cannot do that with. It'll dry like acrylics and because the binder's acrylic. Um, the gouache I use, yes, you can re-wet them. But I tend not to do that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to get chunky on you. You have mm -hmm. to like mix it very well, almost like put it almost in a blender. And I just don't want to go through all that. So usually when, when it dries on me, I don't try to re-wet it and keep using it. I just toss it. That's why I try to squeeze out just the right amount. And even that's a calculation because you're going to use more blue and more white than any other colors that you're going to have on your palette. Stuff like reds. Yeah. Just a little bit. You know, reds are powerful colors. Just a little bit of that. Um, Yellow is probably the second largest pile you'll put. And it goes from there. So, so I just a, want to make sure I didn't get, leave that you, get a big tube of white gouache and you can and, and a big tube of yellow, and then you can get smaller tubes of the other ones. Is that what you're you saying? Could, um, the largest tube I have of my gouache is the white, the mm -hmm. titanium white only. Yep. Be careful with the white because titanium white is the most opaque of all whites. But if you mess around and get like a, mm -hmm. a Chinese white or primary white, those are transparent whites, and you don't get mm -hmm. really upset when you're trying to make these final detailed yeah. highlights. And it's like, why can I not see this? What's going on? It's because you didn't pick up the opaque white, which is usually titanium. Yeah. Okay. I just noticed something that I'm going to have to share uh, from the comments. Okay. Uh, so someone just found this channel and didn't ha has never found any nature journaling stuff uh, online before. So really, really lucking out here. No, you're in your fair treat. <laughs> Hopefully, maybe they can come to the Nature Journaling Conference coming up next week, too. Um, glad, glad you found us. All right, cool. This is so, man, I, I think I'm going to have to go buy some gouache and start messing around with it. I think last time I talked to you, too, I got all inspired to, to uh, do some uh, experimentation with gouache. All mm -hmm. right, so uh, one last question about, the, um, about your class and everything. Like, what are you doing to prepare um, you know, for teaching this class, just to give an idea to the people who are on the other side of the screen, you know, what are you doing as a teacher to prepare for your class? Okay, well, I sent in the reference photo that I'm going to use for the, the hummingbird itself. It was a picture that I took um, in my backyard. I set my phone on a tripod, I set it on the video setting, and I ran and hide behind the corner. Yeah. <laughs> and, and hope and pray that a hummingbird showed up, and it did. Um, 
And of course, I took like a freeze frame pic of it. And I have not, sometimes I'll think, oh, maybe I should paint one before time and be like, hey, this is what I did. But then I, I decided against it. I'm like, when I paint this hummingbird, it's going to be the first time I painted it. It's going to be the first time you see it painted. And I did that because I don't want to feel like it's rehearsed mm-hmm. in a sense, because if I rehearsed it, I may say, oh, that didn't turn out the way the last one did. Yeah. And then I'll think, oh, I've done something wrong. When it's like, no, each painting is its own character. Uh-huh. You know, if I paint a hummingbird now, my aim is to not try to recreate it before you during the event. Uh, you just you have to trust the process, you know, start off with your darks. Um, what do you need? Look at the picture. Now, you got to be careful because when you look at a picture, the colors are flattened by the camera. As good as the cameras are these days, it still don't look like what, what your natural eye would see. So we may have to compensate for that. We may have to say, yeah, I see this green, but it's not popping like it was when I saw it. So mm-hmm. let's add this to it. You know, sometimes when you paint directly from a photo, and this is something I've been making a mistake on in my early days, I'll paint it exactly the way it looks in the photo. And then when I look at it, it looks flat. It looks yeah. like this and it looks flat. And I'm like, well, I did what I saw. But going back to what do you see in nature and making those observations, that's why we journal. I know when the sun is bright in the sky and I hold up this leaf up to the sky and, and I see like the light shine on it, it's going to look this shade of green. Mm-hmm. I could take a picture of it, but guess what? The, the shading has been shifted. Yeah. You know, so you have to be careful about it, or the values may shift. I know if I look in the shadows on a photograph, you take a photograph and you see a tree and the shade underneath it. If you're not careful, you'll take a picture of the tree and the tree will look nice, but the shadow will look like super black. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And you know that it was not that dark. Right. When you look at it. That's what you got to be careful of. Yeah, working from photos, that is so interesting. I'm so glad. I mean, that could be a whole conversation too. That yes, came up a lot. I'm going to show a couple of... Um, I was on this uh, birding and nature journaling trip and we had a lot of hummingbirds. Um, and one of the things that was happening is some people there were taking photos. Mm-hmm. So what would happen is I would be drawing from life and everything's happening. There's a bunch of different species. Um, they're moving quickly. I'm trying to, you know, use my watercolors, match colors. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, then someone will come up with their camera and be like, hey, actually, look, the color is like this. And then they start showing me the photo and part of me is just like, no, don't, I don't want to see. I don't, don't see, really don't, don't contaminate that. yourself. <laughs> right. It's right. Like, and then it gets really confusing because then you look at the photo and it could be the same bird. And all of a sudden you're like, it, it looks, it can look totally different. Yes, it could. And the cool thing about that, even I see this bird that I gave as a reference photo, I know I'm not going to aim to paint just like the way it looks. And I hope the folks there who are watching on won't feel like, well, it don't look like the photo. I think I messed up. Yeah. Hold on. You know, you may not have messed up. Uh, so many times I'll take the reference photo that I use to start the painting. And like maybe at the 80 percent, I quit looking at it. I was like, yeah, yeah. you have to know when to uh, jump off and say, OK, now I got to respond to what my painting needs. Right. Not say it. Because here's something that's been tripping up for my whole life. Where people say your your art is supposed to look exactly like your reference photo. Mm-hmm. If it looks exactly like your reference photo, you are a good artist. That is not true. You're not a Xerox machine. You're not a copier. Stop it. You know, it's like you know, it's like if I ever get mad and start pointing my finger, that's that's when I'll do. I was like, stop, stop, stop it. Because you're the artist. You t- the reference picture is like a launch pad to get you off the ground. Now, how you land or how you stick the landing. You hope you stick the landing. You know, that's on you. But uh, you can do all kinds of amazing things while you're in the air and come down. <laughs> with a I mean, yeah, it's a total gymnast analogy. But, yeah, you, you know, they run, they jump off the springboard and you hope they land. You know, you don't want to crash and burn. Yeah. But we'll treat our art so harshly. And, and I have to be careful because I'll do it to my work where yeah. I'm super critical of it. Like, oh, it didn't look like that in my restaurant period. Or it didn't look like what it did in my head when I wanted yeah. it. And you have to learn to be flexible with yourself because I guarantee you, if you put that reference picture away, quit looking at it, turn your picture away from you or get out the room, come back in 30 minutes. Yes. You're like, oh, that's pretty. You know, but you were yeah. so harsh because you were comparing it so much to what you think you should have painted. So, yeah. There, there's so much on that psychological side of it for sure. 
Well, man, I think we're already going over time here with the conversation. Oh, but let's do That's let's it. do some of this. Uh, let's do a lightning some of this light these lightning round questions. Okay, just because it's it's always fun. Um, it, it gets the creative uh, you know juices flowing, and and people really enjoy it. So I'm gonna put on the. Um, I had a way to make a lightning bolt show on here, but I, oh, no. <laughs> oh god, okay. But All I right, so they're gonna. We're, they're, they, you did this before last time you were on the show, I think. So, yeah, uh, the first ones are just going to be yes or no questions, and then after that, they're going to be sort of um, like hypothetical questions. So, um, we'll start with the, the yes or no questions here. All right, first one is Is coffee an essential art supply? Yes, okay, <laughs> it can be. I, I, I started drinking it more and more now, but it, it just helps. Okay, organized or messy? Messy, okay. Uh, do you like making art alone or with other people? Mm, alone. Okay. I can't uh, be with people, but I, if I were to choose, like, I'll probably do it by myself. But Yeah. Does your family understand your art? They do, yes. Uh, do you eat snacks while you're making art? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Are you a perfectionist? Mm, oh, gosh. <laughs> I'd say no. I can be, but really, I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, would, would you rather uh, draw plants or animals? Plants. Okay. Ink or graphite? Oh, gosh. Oh, uh, graphite. Okay. <laughs> it's almost a tie, but graphite. Do you ever have to put art supplies in your mouth? No. <laughs> um, I was tempted with my soft pastels. Soft pastels, they look tasty, but no. Oh, yeah. That would be, that would be rough. Yeah, uh, rough. Uh, do you like the big picture or the micro? Oh, uh, big picture. Okay. Uh, would you rather paint on Mars or in the deep sea? Well, I'd try Mars out. It probably has some nice earth tones over there. Oh, I think that <laughs> under, yeah, your uh, yellow ochre is going to come in handy. Yeah, yeah, I think I want that one. Actually, of all the people I've interviewed, I feel like you, you would, your, I would want to see your art on Mars. Um, more than anyone else's, actually. Yeah, it's a, well, my, my wife works for NASA, so I'm going to see if I can get her. Oh, out. shoot. Uh, yeah, so maybe I could duct tape one of my paints <laughs> on the side of the shuttle. But it probably would burn be... after it leaves the atmosphere. Wow, that would be really cool. Um, uh, do you work fast or slow? Fast. And then what face do you make when someone walks up to you and says, you are so talented, I could never do that? <laughs> um, I'll probably will smile. I'll be like... <laughs> Okay, you know, I'm sure yeah. you did that because you uh, work I, in the field a lot, right? I, I do, and you know, I was in Auburn University teaching 250 fifth graders about journaling um, architecture, the rural architecture landscape of Alabama, the old mom and pop stores, the gas stations, all this mm -hmm. stuff, the barns. And I was teaching, they didn't have all 250 at once, it was over four days, and I was just teaching them, like, you know this stuff is worthy to be captured and all this kind of thing. And they were just eating it all up as far as what I'm doing. So it's it, like, it's just super rewarding to see that people are really catching on to what's happening here. As young yeah. As especially with kids. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a couple more lightning round questions here. Um, if you could have an art superpower, what would your superpower be? Oh gosh. Um, I will probably be able to materialize my supplies. Like mm -hmm. I will not have to get up to go get anything. Now, I don't want to break the, you know, I don't want to break the internet or whatever type of thing, but mm -hmm. if I can just like limit it to pigment or colors that I need, yeah. oh gosh, I would really nice to have a cobalt blue right now. And it's like, mm, yeah, cobalt Ooh, yeah. Blue. that would be awesome. Nice. Nice. That's a new, that's a good one. That's, that's a new one. Okay. If you were going to be stuck on a deserted Island and you could only, and all your survival needs were taken care of, but you could only bring five art supplies, what five oh, art oh, supplies oh. would you take? There's oh, I, beautiful landscapes everywhere too. And there's abandoned buildings, really, really uh, nice abandoned buildings. Okay. Let me ask this question. Does it matter like how many tubes of paint? Like, can I say like my paints and they count as one thing or do I have to? Yeah, like, sure, sure. Yeah, I let people get away with that with the watercolor, so. Okay, well, watercolors, okay. Well, I would need like maybe 10 colors. Okay. I need my paints. Uh, I need my journals to that I'm going to paint in. All right, so we're at two, paints and journal. Okay. Um, I love, I need my needed eraser. Yeah, I need that. Uh, 
my Pashad box. Then my Pashad was like, uh oh, yeah. So that's like four things because I need something to paint on, um, and my water supply. I need okay. water. Yeah, that's it. All right, all right. I can't wait to see your painting from that island. Okay, now uh, here's the last one. Um, what animal do you think would be best at nature journaling? Oh, if that animal's in front of me with the painted? No, like what animal could be, would have the right personality to be really good at like making art and nature journaling and stuff? Oh gosh, you know, they're just cool and docile or whatever and let me paint them. Um, you know what? I don't know why this animal popped in my head. It's kind of like that whole um, Ghostbuster movie. Like if you think about it, it'll show up. Um, a sloth. I don't know yeah, what there you go. Like, it's like I don't get to see one every day. I mean, I know I'm used to cows and they'll be there, but I, for some reason, I think a sloth would just go and just hang there and just I'm like, perfect. Oh, he's, he's posing. Okay, that's the that's the fun thing about the lightning round is uh you know just seeing what we can uh you know what our brains come up with when we have to uh think fast there. All right, good job surviving the lightning round. All right, so um you know is there uh. You know, my last sort of big question here is, uh, you know, like what would be your because you you have a you have a full time job and everything, so your art is sort of, um, you know, on top of that. But um, and, and and you can answer this however you want. But like, um, what would like a dream pro? What would your dream project be? Oh, um, for my art. Yeah. Okay, this is one of those like those in game questions where it's like, if I can do this, I can I can sign off happy. I would love to be able to travel these county roads, these places where people don't travel that often. They can be dirt roads or barely gravel on them. And I just wanted to just capture each one of these little landmarks along the way. The old churches that were built in the late 1800s, the gas stations, the old truck rusting in the past with a tree growing through it, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the old barns and things. I would have a project to where I capture all these and and put them in a collection of the rows that they're on. Um, the one I already thought of, and I wrote it in my writing journal, it's called County Rose. I grew up in Greensboro, Alabama off of Highway 69, and 69 will connect to Highway 25, which my farm is on, Highway 14, where another place I like to look at, Highway 80 going through Demopolis. I want to have like each chapter of Highway 14, and you'll see all these landscapes mm -hmm. in Highway 14. And if there's like a, a catfish ponds are all over the place. So you'll see the bird, the great eagles, you know, great blue mm -hmm. herons, bald eagles. They will be on that spread. And then I'll move on to the next road. And here will be another wave of art. Because I want people, when they pick up my journal, if I'm dead, you know, when I'm dead and gone or whatever, this is what I told the young people in Auburn. I want you to know about my history. And you can pick up one of my journals and know everything there is to know about what's special to Tim. And if somebody would say, hey, if you would put this in a time capsule, which journal would it be? I will say in less than 0.5 seconds, take this one. Mm -hmm. Throw it in there. And I wrote enough of my thoughts in there while I painted it to where somebody, you know, could just deconstruct and I guess reverse engineer my thought processes. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I mean, I would, uh, I, an atlas with, uh, to, of your, of that area with your art in it. I mean, that would be an amazing, an amazing book to look at. Wow, great, um, great, great answer to that question. So, um, is there anything else that you know that maybe um, I didn't, I, I didn't think of asking, or or anything we didn't, we didn't talk about that you think would be good to to bring up in this conversation, or anything I forgot that's um, important? I wanted to say so. You you've done an amazing job with what you do, and you know I know you're here interviewing me, but I always want to be like, hey, give you your shout out, man. You were, you know, I found you doing this thing like this guy's journaling in this wild place and this wild place he's on the coast and the tide's coming in he's still painting there like you know it, it, so i'm seeing you having the time of your life and it's one of those things where you know shout out for you for even doing this okay and and what you're doing inspires me to keep doing what i'm doing because like i said i'll hit a wall but i know if i go to your you know page and youtube channel and all that stuff like oh he's having a good time let me get back on it and i'll go on from there so i can't think of something that you miss because you really done an awesome job of just picking my brain and i'm just super excited to have 700 plus people to show them and watch me paint a hummingbird and i hope that after all this is over you now we can still all be friends we still keep up with one another you know subscribe to my website you know 
let me know what you're doing. I would love to see people hashtag and they'll say, I painted this during Tim's. Yeah. Morning. I love that. I did one for the International Journalist Week with um, Benton. Yeah. And she's awesome. And she's also um, doing her thing too after me. Like right after my class, she picks up. Yeah. I was like, no, I can't believe it. it's like 92 people looked in what I was doing. And here they are yeah. showing you know, this bee that's in this flower doing his job, you know, being a pollinator. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what I want everybody just to get excited about doing and don't take yourself too seriously. If you don't have the shade of blue, it's not all over. You still can come out with something very nice. So I don't want people to stress over anything. All right, great. Well, here's your here's Tim's website and I put up your Instagram before, so definitely go check that out. Um and let me show that other one, the Instagram here again. Also, um, if you want to see uh, another conversation um, or that we had, I think it was a year, a little more than a year ago, yeah. on my YouTube channel or just go on YouTube and search for uh, Timothy Joe birding and nature journaling, something like that. Yes. And you can see a whole other conversation in that one because we didn't get to talk about um, you know, the, your, your brother and your, your family farm and the birding tours and all of that stuff. So if people want to, they can go check that out. Um, that was like a, a much like more, that was more of a serious, we got into some serious topic topics. We talked yeah. about race. We talked about racism in the U S and how that affects art and, and, and getting out in nature. And we talked a whole bunch about that. So for, for all of that stuff, go check out that other episode. Um, people are, it sounds like people are look, look, Angie right here is taking your class and really ex excited for, uh, for next week. Um, and, uh, people, people enjoyed the interview. Oh. So, um, thank you so much for being on the show again. I know it's like last minute, right before. Right no, before. this is perfect. This is awesome. Cause that, that means I don't have to wait long for us to get together and start painting. All right, great. And I definitely want to come someday. I have a dream of coming and visiting your farm when the swallowtail kites are flying around and doing some oh, uh, paintings and hang out with you and your brother out there. That would be awesome. That would be awesome, man. That would be awesome. Bring your journals and stuff because there's a lot of stuff to see over there. Great, great. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining in and thanks for everyone who watched during the live. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Bye. All right. Take care.